It's July 15th, 2021. This is Rook. Get your drum chops ready. They are a new generation of Iranian drummers and percussionists, and they're based in two different parts of the world, but united in making big strides on their respective instruments. Hamta Bari is an Iranian Indian daf player who's building a devoted following around the world and has become the first Iranian woman who plays Indian rhythms on the daf. She will join us from Pune, India. And Nasreen Rahmani is a professional percussionist who grew up in Australia and is now one of the most coveted players on conga and Cajon in Spain. She joins us from Madrid. Plus, we have a new edition of It's All Persian to Us with Keon. This is Conversations From, To, and About the Iranian Diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode 127 of Rook. Sado bisto haft, Kianjan. Yes, Jian. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to help you learn the numbers. Indeed. How you doing, everybody? Durut, Khoshomadid. For those of you listening in Canada, hello. For those of you listening around the world, hello, hello, hello. Well, I'm awake now. <sighs> you have to. Because they can't hear as well because oh, they're see. further away. Ah, I'll write so you that have down. To, yeah, try right now. Say like say hello to me because I. Yeah. Hello. It's good. <laughs> see. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> say somebody's listening in in uh, uh, Myanmar. What would you? You'd have to. You know, got to hear you, right? Hello. <laughs> hello. Okay. That's weird. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I have no idea. <laughs> Strap yourselves in for another edition of Rook. Uh, We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, see us on social media. Switch over to YouTube or Instagram right now. Rook Media is the handle. And if you like your Rook descriptions in or bulletins in Persian and English, check us out on Telegram. Telegram. Hello, Shia. Hi, hi. Captain Reza. Hello. Hello, sir. Sir. Yeah, <laughs> sir. He's the. Uh, it's that's the way captains. You know. Sir. Sir. Yeah. Sir. Aye, aye, captain. Yeah. <laughs> sir. Yeah. Sir. Uh, hello, Kian Jun. Hi, Jun. This is my drummer episode. Yeah, you're. That's your thing, right? That's. Uh, you were but, once a drummer, or you're still a drummer. <laughs> see, the, for if it's not questioning whether I know how to cook, it's questioning whether well, I'm still a drummer. Okay, I haven't seen you drum recently, right? The, or know? ever? <laughs> or ever? For yes, that matter. I am still. I don't think one stops being a drummer. <laughs> you but never know. I'm just probably shittier than I was <laughs> touring. But yeah, yes, I am. A, thank you, Kian. Thank you. We're going to two places in the world. Uh, India and Spain. Hamas Karanot. Hamas Karanot. Hamta Bari and Nasreen Rahmani. Kion. Cool. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the daf is? Uh, it's the, uh, that um, how do you explain it? The drummy thing? Yes, thank it's you. Like that's that's a, I think that's the, ex- that's, that's the official <laughs> explanation, that <laughs> drummy <laughs> thing. Yeah. How do you explain it? I don't know. You well, they're me. all drummy <laughs> things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, go ahead, genius. <laughs> well, how, how do you hold it? How do you play uh, it? Like, like out away from your face and uh, you kind of move it around. Right. That explains right? it. For people who don't know what a daf is, they've got a, a good sense of it now. <laughs> from, uh, yeah. It's a drummy thing that you hold away from, hold your, away face. from yeah. your face. Not to be confused with a doff, which means a hot person, right? Hot doff. Girl, yeah. Oh, I didn't know That's that. True. Yeah. True. There you go, Gian. You're welcome. Can a man be a doff? 
Man is puff actually. <laughs> a puff? For real? Yes. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A oh, puff and a doff? That yes. before. What's a puff? Wow, not since Isa and Musa. <laughs> 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 a puff and a doff, yeah. huh? <laughs> Can you use them in the same sentence? Oh my God, there's a puff and a doff walking down yes. the street. You know, like a yeah, ajab puff, yeah. You know, but, uh-huh. but it's, it's... Puff doesn't sound very complimentary no. for some no. reason. Yeah, it's it's kind of... Pretty puffy. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so puff is a male, a hot male? Doff. Yes, puff actually is a kind of um, uh, not hot male, but yeah, when uh, yes, kind of when the, the same as. Oh my God! Between you and Keon, <laughs> the same. What, what, what is the description of puff and daff? Let's get this together, guys. Yeah. Drummy thing. I just know It is a, 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 a no, drummy thing. <laughs> that is a hot man drummy thing. Hot man drummy thing. What is that? Uh-huh. No, I mean it's not that uh, because doff is more common mm. yeah, when you say right. when you see a mm. hot girl you say right. ajab doff here, yeah. but for men it's yeah. But you can say pop. is is doff a pejorative? Is it is it um, would a, a woman be offended if you say you're a doff? Uh, it depends on the woman. <laughs> 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 Some doves I may see, be offended. I see. <laughs> I see. There's an entire song about. I think it's a black cat. So I was like. Duffy June, Duffy June, Duffy. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. Well, anyway, I had a I had a puff and a duff with my salad (laughs) salad earlier. (laughs) It was. uh, Oh, Come over tonight for a puff and a duff. Uh, (laughs) Shia will have a have a beer and. Anyway, Hamta Bari, Hamta Bari, I should say, um, is in India now, and she is a, a fantastic daf player, um, <clears throat> which is a, it's a Middle Eastern instrument you hold sort of um, vertically and you play with your fingers, and uh, it's obviously well known to Persians, but, uh, and she plays Indian rhythms. Uh, she's learned to play Indian rhythms on, on the DAF. Uh, really looking forward to talking to her. And then Nasreen Rahmani, who's amazing on the cajon. Do you know what the cajon is? Uh, it sounds Spanish. <laughs> Some kind of drum that is Spanish? Yeah, well, um, it's not actually, I don't think it's a Spanish. Is it, was it originally Spanish, the drum? Um, I think so, actually. Maybe. Uh, but it's like a box you've seen mm. Persians play. It's like a box you sit on right, and right, then you right. play with your hands. Okay, got it. Like a wood, wood box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're looking at you're you're saying yes, but you're looking at me blankly, <laughs> like a like a doff or a puff or something. I don't know. Like, how right, else right. can you explain uh, it for me to understand? If you are a fan of what you're hearing, this riveting conversation, <laughs> these um, the, this dictionary of words, this that that is a an audio program. Please become a patron of Rook. Uh, our website is rookmedia.com, where you can um, press the support us button, and five dollars or ten dollars a month means a lot to us to become patrons to keep this thing going that we crowdsource that's the way we do it we also have some folks who generously step up and and help support the program and today um it's kind of cool this is a percussionist supporting percussionists Mm -hmm. a big shout out to sasha shabani sasha shabani and bongo planet for helping to make this episode of rook possible he is a percussionist who plays various african drums grew up in tehran based in canada now no music no life no music, no life is his credo. Bongo Planet was founded by Sasha in 2012. He created Bongo Planet to share his love for composing contemporary music within the styles of new age, ambient, chill, uh, house and lounge music. He plays hand drums. He also plays piano, keyboards, and some harmonic on these tracks. Check out bongoplanet.com. That's the website, bongoplanet.com, or his Instagram page, Bongo Planet Music. You know who we've got coming up on the coming days, uh, Keo? Uh, I didn't look at the board. Who I am excited have? about this. Uh, I, well, we've mentioned him on the show before that he's coming, but uh, the um, the interesting uh, character slash broadcaster, artist, fashion designer, musician, Behzad Bulur, ah, who okay. will be well known to most Persians around the world, especially if they're interested in music and culture, arts and culture, because he's been on the BBC, BBC Persian, that is, for over 30 years, on radio first and then TV. A very interesting guy. And uh, and I look forward to our interview. I'm sure it's going to be um, go to some interesting places. Behzad Bulur on Monday on Rook. Uh, also, Dr. Sheila Nazarian. 
or Dr. Oh, Sheila Nazarian, as right, she's right. probably known. She's an award-winning plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. She has this um, Netflix show, That's right. Skin Decision, Skin Decision Before and After. Yeah, she's a celebrity plastic surgeon. She is, mistaken. and That's it's right. about time. You know, we've been doing <laughs> yeah. this show for over a year. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's a f- focused on Iranians in the diaspora. We haven't spoken to a plastic surgeon oh, yet. That's going to be <laughs> so Wouldn't good. this be an occasion to do so? <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, uh, uh, Keon, we'll do the interview, and then perhaps we can get some work done. Actually, uh, I might and need become it. puffs and buffs. <laughs> <laughs> become puffs and buffs. <laughs> Try to get a discount. Does actually. a puff have uh, work done usually uh, on him? Uh, uh, does a, or or would a, it's more likely to be a puff if you haven't had surgery? Uh, Actually, Shaya. that's a good point. You know, puff usually I, they have surg- they they did some surgery actually. Uh huh. Okay. Ah. Yeah, that kind right. of uh, Got uh, male it. we used to say puff. So they so they have to puff themselves up. Uh huh. Quite literally. Is is puff a uh, palang for men? Uh-huh. Yeah, good, uh-huh. good. That's so good. So I, yeah, I learned the word palang two years ago. Yeah, uh, and you know what palang is? I do. You do? Yes, oh, I do. I know what palang. Yeah, yeah. How would you describe palang? So puff is not the uh, is not dot like doff. Uh, if somebody t- t- tell me that I just puff you shoddy, <laughs> maybe I would offend it. You know, because, okay. Yeah. But right. So doff is more of a positive mm-hmm. term. Yes. What's yes. the difference between doff and palang? <laughs> <laughs> you can be doff and not be palang, I think. Uh-huh. But if you're palang, uh, all of these words sound wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, they all sound like they're offensive. They all sound offensive. I don't know if I should you, 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 see. You guys teach me these words, and then I go say them to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> you're not <laughs> supposed. I'm shitty palangi shitty, and then she's like, "What? Where did you learn that?" And I'm like, "From Shia, <laughs> you know, sweet Shia. See the veneer." <laughs> you know, he's like this sweet guy. <laughs> In the meantime, he's trafficking in all these words you know Such a uh, I would date a dove but I wouldn't date a palang mm. oh yeah. okay ah. all right well let that be a lesson to all of you out there <laughs> Sh- Shia will reject you if you're a palang but not if you <laughs> Jesus what is th- this show used to have you know we started oh, it with geez. it was integrity <laughs> it was like Abbas Milani would come on and talk about history you know I love how Shia gets into it like it's a history you know the duff first <laughs> he's yeah. Yeah, like he seems very invested he's like so what is a uh, what is a uh, a word for a um, an attractive man that is a more acceptable word um, like, like oh. what would you like to be called I guess khoshtip, right? Yeah. 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 That's like handsome. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. But what do you, if you want to say, oh, that guy's really hot, what do you say? Oh. Uh, Puff. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. Uh, oh, you would say, ajab jigari. Uh-huh. Oh. Jigar. Liver. Jigarito. Yeah. Khoshtip. Yeah. Let, let's, let's go with khoshtip. But jigar, I've heard jigar. Yeah. I've been called jigar my day. <laughs> <laughs> A few times. Uh, more recently, actually. By your uh, mother? Or? <laughs> <laughs> actually, yes. <laughs> jigar. Uh, uh, Kayvon Zand coming up on our show, uh, the uh, non binary queer performance artist in New York. I'm so looking forward to speaking to Kayvon on our program. And Tara Tiba, mm-hmm. the Iranian Australian musician. Why are you shaking your head? I'm just saying all killer, no filler. That's, That's what's right. Through my head. Some good guests so, coming up. Mm. Yeah. Good guests coming up in the coming days on Rook. All right. Speaking of good guests, Ham Tobari in Pune, India, and uh, Nastreen Rahmani in Madrid, Spain coming up. But first, it's Thursday. You know what that means. She's a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a tennis playing sensation, and a bicultural relation. And lovable, smart, occasionally funny, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Batshaw. It's all Persian to us with Kion Nademi. <laughs> Dogs could hear so, us. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to see how far I can Take stretch it. it. Work out the lungs before we <laughs> get to uh, this. Uh, well, it's all Persian to us, the uh, popular segment where Keon explains to us things that Persians really have invented, as opposed to the uh, all the things we usually claim that um, we potentially haven't invented. So what do you have for us this week, Keon? Well, once upon a time when I lived in the Middle East, I was driving when I suddenly got lost in the middle of the desert. 
Believe me, guys, this does happen. It didn't last long, but in those 20 minutes, I prepared for the worst and thought a lot about survival. Hang on a second. I'm already tripped up by this. You were driving in the desert. Yeah, this is like way back when I think the GPS system wasn't updated or something. So I got lost. Yes, I was by myself. You were driving by yourself in the desert in the Middle East. Yes, this is besides the point, but yes, I was. That's, (laughs) there's a lot of questions. This makes sense. I mean, this woman can't go to the the gym without coming with a friend. (laughs) How 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 is it that you were driving (laughs) alone in the desert? Be more specific. Where in the Middle East? (laughs) I'm like, I'm just giving you a small section. Did you make this part up for the sake of the story? No, really, I was driving. I had to meet some friends and I swear in the I desert just, I got lost in the desert where in Sudan no <laughs> <laughs> this is actually UAE. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. The point being, I panicked and I thought a lot about survival. I thought about, you know, about the four things that uh, intro life on Earth for humans and all earthly animals for that matter. They are air, water, food, and shelter. Though for Persians, kabob kubida might actually be added to that list. It's, you know, it's a matter of survival. Uh, so shelter depends on the climate of where you are. So that can vary between hours to weeks. Food, you can last approximately three weeks without. Air, we can't last more than three minutes without leaving us with the number two most crucial element of life, water. Water. We can only last three days without water. That's why it's called the elixir of life. We can last three days without water? That's right. Hmm. Would you like to try? Well, you know, once I was driving by myself through (laughs) in in Siberia. (laughs) I (laughs) lived with some friends. uh, uh, Me and a shotor, (laughs) two two donkeys were in a... And I did not have water for at least three days. I did not. Oh, sucks, I was man. panicking. Right. Seriously. Well, yes, by yourself in a... Yeah, I lived in Dubai. Now, can I, and there can are I ask a question? I, I, I'm really asking this question because I've never been to an actual desert. Okay. Um, th- so the desert has a road going through it? Yes. Uh-huh. I mean... So you're, yeah. you're driving on a road. Yeah. You're not driving road. through the desert. Right, right. But uh-huh. it's I'm, I was surrounded by deserts. Uh-huh. Yeah. So anyway, water is the elixir of life. After all, 60% of the human body is water. So riddle me this, how were Persians able to build the largest empire the world had ever seen out of a predominantly dry and unforgiving landscape with minimal access to fresh water? Mm. Well, the <laughs> <laughs> You riddled us that, yes. Well, guys, the answer lies in an ingenious invention by the name of Qanat. Invented around 1000 BC, Qanats were underground water channels that were engineering marvels, even till this day. They quite literally saved our lives and ensured our survival for thousands of years. This is probably one of the main reasons that Persians value engineers so much, actually. So Persia was comprised of mostly dry land, but it also had a lot of mountains. In fact, it was surrounded by them. By the way, these mountains also helped with our survival as a barrier against enemies. And where there's a mountain, there's also fresh water. But how to access it? Well, those ancient Persians figured out a way. By building underground channels from the mountains where the water was sourced from and leading them to different areas of need at lower altitudes. Waterways. Yeah. We invented waterways. Underground waterways, Mm. yeah. So some ran as long as 40 kilometers and contributed to the system of more than 160,000 kilometers of water delivery. That's some serious coverage, guys. Mm -hmm. So these planots were used for several different purposes, including drinking, farming, refrigeration, air conditioning, and creating lush, beautiful gardens in the middle of the deserts. Why not, right? Mm -hmm. So the planot system was so effective that it soon spread to other corners of the world, first through the ancient Persian conquests, and later by the invading Arabs who adopted the system and carried it with them to Andalusia, Sicily, and North Africa. In fact, the Ghanat was so incredibly invaluable to surrounding civilizations, so much so that the ancient Egyptians even honored Darius the Great with the title of Pharaoh in return for introducing the system to them. Isn't that cool? All right. Yeah. So So the the, uh, the Ghanat is the actual... Waterway, the but tunnel? That's right, like the underground water tunnels. That's the Qanat. You, yeah. you probably knew that. Yes, yes, yes. Did you, can you visit the Qanats? Actually, my home in Tehran was in the area which is called Charrah Qanat, and there is mm. a very old Qanat in there. Oh. Yeah. That's interesting. It's very cool. Yeah. Well, in fact, one of the most impressive examples can be found in the ancient city of Persopolis, or mm. Persepolis. Yeah. 
The city was built in a hot and dusty terrain surrounded by the Zagros Mountains, a location less than ideal and not exactly endowed with nature's bounty. Yet by way of the Qanat, Persopolis became the epicenter of an empire that stretched from Greece to India and was regarded by many as the most luxurious city in the world, famed for its opulent palaces and exquisite gardens. Sorry, wasn't it Persepolis? Persepolis? What did per- I say? Persopolis? Yeah, Persepolis. Persepolis. I don't know. I never know how to pronounce that properly I think it's in English. Persepolis. Are That's you the sure? way to pronounce it. I've yeah. heard people say Persepolis. No one's ever said Persepolis. I swear to God, yeah. British people pronounce it that <laughs> no, way. No, they don't. Right. No, they don't. Maybe it's yeah. the French. Cause it's you know, Persepolis. tomato, tomato, Gian. No, no. I, I'm pretty sure about this one. I think it's Persepolis. <laughs> All right, I'll say Persepolis. <laughs> I think that E in the word is not an O. Persepolis. Persepolis is a So this was only made possible by. Ghanats. As such, it's easy to see the ingenuity of ancient Persians. Wow. The Ghanat helped lead to a handful of other Persian inventions, by the way, including the first refrigerator. Re- refrigerator? <laughs> the Akhchal. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Akhchal. Air conditioning, the art of gardening, and even ice cream. Wait, air conditioning? Yeah. We, I, we, it was, we, you mean not really air conditioning? The air conditioning. The air conditioner as we it's, know it today? Yeah. Well, no, not, no, not no, like no, a, right. you know, obviously not a like <laughs> battery <laughs> operated. <laughs> like, come so, on, Gio. So <laughs> <laughs> but, electric, you know, like, okay, like yeah. ancient air conditioning. Uh-huh, yeah, right, I'll get to right. that at some point, but okay, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, with all that the Ghanat helped Persians accomplish, it's hard to imagine what would have been without it. Would the mighty Persian army have been so mighty? Could Persia have become the largest empire in the world without access to fresh water? Where would we be without the paradise-like gardens that inspired poets like Hafez and Sadi to write such beautiful poetry? Mm. Or most importantly, would I, Kion Nademi, oh. have even existed without the flow of water from ancient Qanats? Oh. Actually, prob- know, right? probably, because you were born in <laughs> Iowa. <or something. laughs> well, I, my ancestors probably couldn't uh-huh, have flourished, I see, right, and yes. I would have been, I don't know, not right. here, probably. A speck of dust in the <laughs> desert. Exactly. Uh, being, yeah. yeah. So let's all raise a glass of H2O, or in my case, a jug, and give thanks for this wondrous invention that gave life to the Persian Empire, because in the end, it's all Persian to us. Oh, okay. And yeah. not. Yeah. You know, you, what I, you know what I love about this one? Why? It what? sounds like it, we, it really was invented by the Persian. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to well, the Well, I mean, usually yeah. you're coming in here with the, we took the cats and we swung them at the Egyptians <laughs> and then we, we, we were on high heels yeah. and the Egyptians the <laughs> ceded territory to us. I mean, this was like a very, you know, it's a clean, yeah. you know, obvious kind of, uh, invention that Isn't came that incredible? From. You know, th- I'm just wondering what they were thinking. They're surrounded by desert. They're like, okay, let's see. We have mountains there. There's water in them, but how do we, you know, how can we make use of it? And mm-hmm. they came up with a way. What were the Qanats made of? Um, okay. I sh- Sorry, I always <laughs> ruin things by asking <laughs> questions, don't I? <laughs> I, I don't know exactly, but, uh, you know, they, they were... It's like, inconsequential. So we, we made the Qanats. Yeah, we, we don't need to know. Okay, yeah. stop asking don't questions. About it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you very much Kian. Uh, another edition of it's all persian to us add cannot to the list uh, fantastic the fabulous Kian, groovy shaya captain reza stick around we're going to do a couple of interviews and then come back to you guys for a wrap-up let's get to our guests my first guest is an iranian percussionist who is making a name and big musical waves in india take a listen to this of our first guest today, Hamta Balginijad, was born in Tehran. She started her journey as a percussionist in her early teens in Tehran, learning to play the Middle Eastern drum called the Daf. In addition to the Daf, she played Tonbak and Cajon for a short period, and then became a percussionist instructor teaching in schools and cultural centers in Iran. She also worked as the director of the largest Daf workshop in the Arasbaran Cultural Center. 
In 2018, after a few visits, Hamtel made the decision to move to India to further learn Indian rhythms and to make a change in her playing style in a bigger pond. Since then, she has been learning Hindustani tall and in less than three years has become the first Iranian woman who plays Indian rhythms on the deaf. Hamta has accompanied renowned artists such as the legendary A.R. Rahman in concert in Mumbai last year. She's played with the famous Rajasthani band in Jaipur in 2018 and has performed with large orchestras and leading bands in prestigious halls across India and Iran. And right now, Hamta Balkhenijad joins me from Pune, India today. Hello. Hello, Gian. Hello, everyone. I hope you are safe and doing great. I'm thankful for having me today. It's so nice to have you on the program. Thank you for doing this. You know, you have said that you always loved rhythms from as early as you can remember. Do you know why? Did you did you have a drummer in your family? Why were you so drawn to, to making rhythms? So actually, I come from a uh, musical family. My mom always has been singing since she was a teenager. And my father uh, is keen on music a lot. Even I remember he used to tell us that uh, I couldn't even take shower without music or driving without music. And mm. my brother is graduated in music from uh, Holanistan Mustaqim Tehran, and he's currently uh, director, assistant, and photographer in cinema. Uh, he's in Iran, and my sister lives in America, and she's percussionist too. She's she, uh, she teaches to Iranian and non-Iranian deaf. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Who's better? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm elder and I'm, I'm better than her. <laughs> That's so interesting. Well, this answers my question. You obviously come from a very um, musical family. I mean, you were born in the early 90s, and I was going to say, what kind of music and artistry were you exposed to? Did you Were you hearing Western music, or was it more classical sonati Iranian music when you were a kid? I would say any genre of music, uh, and I never ever, uh, how can I tell you, limit myself to because I play the deaf, I should only listen to uh, traditional music or folk music, and I would love to listen to all genres of music, Western, pop, rock, yeah, everything. But when you were a kid, what were you exposed to? Mostly, uh, I can say pop and uh, folk. Uh-huh. Do you hear rhythms? I know this is true for a lot of uh, drummers, and it's it's been true for me my whole life. Do you hear rhythms in everything you do? Like if you're walking down the street, do you hear the steps? If you're if you hear a tap dripping, do you hear the rhythm of it? I just care about everything and detail about everything. Whatever I'm here, I just want to bring it on my desk and play with that. Of course, I attention pay at close attention to rhythms whatever it's around me nature i just want to bring it on my dad and play with that <laughs> yeah so you talk about your daf as if it's like your little blanket that you take everywhere with you do you are you always with your daf yes of course it's like my go-to friend <laughs> how does your husband yeah. feel about your relationship with your daf he got used to all that <laughs> <laughs> he has to you know he puts up with it. There's a there's a third person yeah. in the relationship, and it's the deaf. No, he's very supportive, and he loves music. He always supports me. Uh, he says, "You go you play." He loves when I play deaf. He really, and I in pandemic, I force him. You, know, you should le- you should learn deaf. He's not hassoud. <laughs> yeah. He's not jealous of the deaf. No, 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 no. Luckily, no. What is the magic of the deaf for you? What What is it about? I mean, you obviously. Um, you're a percussionist who uh, you have talent you you could play the drum kit or or you know you played a bit of cajon and and tone back mm-hmm. why is the daf so so magical for you see i like daf and because it's such a simple instrument but it has such a magical effect I'm a high energy person and it's right my la to play such an energetic instrument yeah, the significant point is because it's very simple instrument and it has a magical sound when I play that. And I really love my instrument. And I cry with that. I talk with my instrument whenever my uh, my mood is not good. My my deaf has not good sound. Can you believe that? Wow. Your emotions are expressed through the way you play the deaf. Of course, yeah. 
That's so interesting. We don't think about that in terms of instruments. We think about that in terms of singers. If somebody's tired or sad, we can hear that in their voice sometimes. But we don't we don't think of it. One, Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. I would love to tell you one thing. When I play that, mostly I close my eyes and I imagine everything. I remember my life. I remember my wounds, pain, happiness, everything. And when when a musician is playing his instrument, he's telling you a story. He's talking about their story through the instrument. Yeah. Do you think that the audience can tell? Do you think that the audience can tell if you're sad by the way you're playing the deaf? They can understand this and they can feel my emotion through my instrument. Many times it had happened for me in India or when I was in Iran, that the audience came to me after my performance and they are crying and hug me and said, we felt your energy. Wow. We got that vibe. And wow. it's just amazing for me. That's incredible. That's the, I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. When, when did you, Hamza, when did you actually think that percussion, I mean, it was obviously your passion, but when did you actually think you wanted to make a career out of this? I think it started from my childhood. I don't want to brag, but I was a naughty, smart, energetic, sweet, and as my mom said, dirty child. And as far as my mom recalls, I was always dancing or tapping my hand or something, or there is the mic in my hand, everything. You know, everything roots in your childhood, Jian. Mm, yes. Everything roots in your childhood. And mm. I remember I was very rhythmic. I always loved to play rhythms, dance with rhythms. That's why I, I think I choose the percussion. But did you? Did it occur to you? I mean, you're this girl in Tehran in the 1990s. Did you think, wow, this could be my job? This will be my career? Um... Yes, it could be my career. I wanted to follow my dream. I wanted to be percussionist, especially deaf player. It was easy because it's a common instrument in Iran. But you went and got a degree in crisis management. I'm assuming that wasn't that didn't help you with playing the deaf, did it? Of course, it's different. And if you see my bad, my diploma is in accounting. I always want to try different patterns, different fields. I wanted to learn new, new things. I don't want to stick only in one field. I know my major didn't relate to my, you know, passion or career, music, that's all. But but if you have a crisis with the DAF, you, you know how to manage it now. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> my instrument never will make a travel for me. That's right. Well, well, let's hope so. I mean, I'd say, you know, it's yeah. so far it's been okay. It starts acting up in your other relationships. We'll see. You made your first trip to India in your early 20s in, in 2015. Tell me about why you took that first trip, because obviously it, you know, you begin this relationship with India that ends up with you moving there, moving out of Iran and going to India to find yourself as a musician. What, what, what did you initially go to India for? What did you want to find there? Actually, I wanted to find myself, but in 2016, I came to India on an educational purpose. And when I went back to Iran after four months, I was pining for India. I really missed India a lot. India is a holy and vast land, as you know, with varieties of festivals, especially music festivals. And we are a little bit alike in culture. They are family-oriented, hospitable, affectionate, and kind-hearted people. And there are two uh, significant reasons I immigrated to India in 2018. Actually, the first reason is I didn't want to be monotonous and ordinary percussionist anymore. That's why I made up my mind to learn new style of music. And as you know, India is rich in music, and for me, their music is just next level. Music and energy and rhythm were so appealing to me that I wanted to study academically. Right. And the second reason, as you know, I got married in India when in 2016 I was in India. Uh, I fell in love. Actually, he fell in love with me. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> In 2018, we got married. I hope you fell in love I, back. It wasn't just he, him falling in love with you. <laughs> yeah, he fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Jian, I was very lucky. 
after three months, when I came to England in 2018, I got an email from a Rajasthani band, and it was an international festival. And it was my memorable experience I had with that Rajasthani band. And after that, I got many offers, concerts, and I have one remarkable concert with uh, one of the most famous uh, composer and singer in India who is Grammy and Oscar winner, Mr. R. Rahman. And I had honor to share that stage with him. Let yeah. me ask you about him. Let me, I want to get to that. Hang on. We're going, we're going too fast here. There's things I want okay. to ask you. <laughs> I mean, first of all, when you... Hala uh, Dorostike, you 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 liked India so much, and you fell in love with mm -hmm. her. But it's still a big decision to decide for an Iranian woman. Okay, I, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm going to India. I'm moving. Um, how difficult a decision was it for you? And how did your parents and family react in Iran uh, when you said, "Okay, that's it. I'm moving moving to India for good." You know, when you are tired, exhausted of many things. Immigration, I think, is the best decision. And I had an experience living in India in 2016. That's why I came to India, because I had a few friends here. I wanted to continue my, you know, music. I still, my parents are in shock, and they can't believe that I left them. I left my country, and I came here. But I'm happy with my choice. You said you partly went to India to find yourself. Yeah. What did you find? There are many bad habits has omitted from me. And I'm very happy. I could find myself. Now I know what makes me happy, what makes me angry. I know myself better. You like who you are in India better than who you were in Iran. 100%. Hmm. 100%. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's good that you found that. I love myself. I respect myself. I know about myself, my talent. I don't underestimate myself. And can I ask you why you couldn't find that, do you think, in Iran? There were many rubbish things around me that didn't let me to find myself. Hmm. I was under pressure from many sides. Country, family. I remember very, I didn't want to talk about that, but I will tell you. Very first day of my career, I wanted to go to uh, one institute. I was very optimistic about that. I went to that institute and the manager of that institute told me, okay, you can come and play, but you should be with me. But you should and be I what? Was, you should be with me. You oh should, boy. Yeah. Should have that relationship with me. And you know, you can't tarnish everyone with the same brush. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are many good people many good institutes, but still you can find this kind of people. Mm -hmm. These sick people you can find everywhere. Mm -hmm. At that time I came to know my optimism was misplaced. And you know, I was tired because I was, I was not belonging to any uh, mafia band. I was always, I've been always an independent artist. And I'm really proud of that. I'm very strong and I'm really proud of that. I mean, I guess the subtext of what you're saying, without getting into too many details that you don't want to talk about, is is it's hard to be the musician you want to be in Iran. Would that be correct? Jan, I just want to tell you one thing. I never done any bad things or dirty things to be on a stage for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Of course. Of course, I understand that. But I'm, what I'm asking is, I mean, do you do you feel like, I mean, I guess you, your family, I mean, your sister's gone to America, you've gone to India. It sounds like even when you're playing an instrument that is uh, ac accepted, respected, involved in, in Iranian music of the current uh, Iran, it's still hard to be everything you want to be as a musician without going to another country. Is that true? When you're facing with uh, sick people, they don't they don't care which kind of instrument you're playing. Which, is it holy? Is it not holy? You know, I hope I, it, does, it makes sense, whatever I'm saying. I hope I can get my message across. Yeah, I just want to know if you think that it's just you had a bad experience or if this, this is something endemic. This has something to do with uh, Iran compared to uh, being outside of Iran. Yeah, it was in Iran, unfortunately. Mostly. Do do people in in Pune know that you're Iranian? 
Or do yes, they? Yes, they know. <laughs> and how do they? <laughs> what do they say? Nothing. They are very uh, supportive, especially when they see my instrument, and especially when they see I can play their rhythms on my instrument. They they are really supportive. I'm very happy. Uh, I have many Indian uh, students who they want to learn in uh, deaf. So so let me ask you about this this this. Um, I mean, you are touted as the first. Iranian woman who plays Indian rhythms on the DAF. Uh, I I know you have your DAF nearby. If you can do this without waking the neighbors, can uh, can you show <laughs> us very simply the difference between, say, Persian style playing on the DAF and Indian rhythms? Okay, I'm going to play the eight beats, which are mostly written in books in Iran. But you know, in total, accent matters where you put the accent. We have uh, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. But I'm going to play one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, yek do stay, yek do stay, yek do tanan, tanan, tan. Aditala, it means eight beats in Indian rhythms, and mostly, you know, it played in Bollywood and it's very energetic and rhythmic. Takadimi takajuno, takadimi takajuno, takadimi takajuno, tata chata kita taka, tata chata kita taka. If you want to play faster. I think now oh. you understand why I came to India because of this spicy and energetic routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. I mean, what's interesting is they're they're similar. It's it's where you're putting the emphasis of the beats. That there, it's, it's it, what you just played is relatively similar similar to each other. It's very nuanced, right? Yeah, I want to tell you one thing. I've been learning Konakol and I've been learning the South Indian classical uh, music and North Indian classical music. North Indian classical music is called Hindustani and South Indian classical is called Carnatic. Okay? And I've been learning the Konakol. Konakol is the art of performing percussion syllables vocally and is the spoken component of Solkato. And solkato is a traditional way of learning and practicing rhythm through vocalization. Hmm. When I was telling takadimi takajuno, takadimi takajuno, I was counting. This is the uh, traditional way of learning and practicing rhythms through vocalization. But that sounds like it's on a four beat. One two three four. One two three four. One two three four. See, takadimi right? takajuno. It's eight. Takadimi takajuno. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What's the second one? Takajumo? Good job. Takajumo. Takajumo. That's very cool. Takadimi Takajuno. Now, with your mouth, show me the Persian style. Uh, got it, got it, got it. Right, uh, right, right, right. Got it, got it. Oh, that's very interesting. Now, and you know, Jian, yeah. being around that energy is really inspiring and kind of motivating. Which energy? This kind of energy is coming from this kind of spicy rhythms in India. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it's really worked for you. Yeah. Going to, do, do, is the daf that they play in India the same exact same instrument as in Iran? No, no. Uh huh. Tell no, me no. They oh, call how it, is it different. They call it dafli, and many people mistake it with daf. Daf is different, and dafli is different. Even the style they are playing is different. So you're you're you, part part of what you're doing that's so different is you are playing a Persian daf, but you're incorporating the Indian rhythms. That's why it was very remarkable and everyone supported me and it was exciting for them and interesting for them. I love it. 
Yeah. There's this amazing drum off on your Instagram between you and a tabla playing guy. He's I mean he's a monster this guy. The way he plays. It's it's incredible. Let me let me play it for people. Take take a listen to this. a little bit of Hamza Bari, I love that, in a drum off with a guy playing tabla. I mean, I guess he's well known. What, tell us about this. You know, it was the first night we met each other and it was completely improvisation. And it was amazing. It's so cool. It's so cool. Who is he? He's one of the uh, most famous tabla player in Chennai, south of India. And uh, I remember he called me and said, Hamta, if you, are Pune, if you are in Pune, I would love to come and we play to each other. I said, yes, of course, you played and it was an amazing. It's very, very cool. When you uh, post something like that, because you're, you've developed quite a social media following, is your audience, who, who is your audience? Are they Iranians who know about you in Iran or are they Indians who follow you or people around the world or who, who, who are the yeah, people? Yeah, yeah. Tell Mostly me. are Indian, uh, American, Spain, and uh, India. India, Iran, Spain, and America, and Turkey. Uh, your husband is Indian. We've established that. Do you teach him yeah. Farsi, or does he teach you Hindi? <laughs> he, just, he just knows bad words. <laughs> <laughs> you, I see. He only hears you when you're cursing, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's for initiative is very most interesting to learn. <laughs> Do you speak Hindi now? Do you can you speak Indian? Tora Tora, me Hindi pata hai. Uh, I know. Uh, do you want to hear? Uh, you know, a, a little bit I can speak, okay, uh -huh. and mostly I can understand because uh, I'm a musician and it's not required. Music is a language that doesn't speak in particular words; it speaks in emotions. Uh -huh. Do you want to? I can speak some Hindi. You want to hear it? Yeah. <laughs> I forgot what the words were. <laughs> but I got the rhythm. <laughs> you are a fast learner. <laughs> you see? Uh, okay, now tell me what it was like to uh, perform with uh, A.R. Rah Rahman. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic performance. I've watched it online, and he gives you this big yeah. introduction. Um, what was that like for you? It was very, how can I tell you? It was marvelous, and he's very humble. He's a very humble guy, very down to earth guy. And I was very happy when I shared the SHB team. It was a Sufi concert and it uh, held in Mumbai. And uh, then after when we finished our performance, his daughter came to me and said it was amazing. And you know how much you feel good when they're satisfied with your work. For the first time you are going with your, you know, uh, traditional instrument you are going to play another rhythms another language it feels good how did he find you go and ask god i don't know <laughs> okay. god's grace has always been with me and you know jian my desire meet met with hard work and belief of course of course and mostly they mostly they find me on instagram so, yeah, A.R. Rahman was tooling around on Instagram and found you and said, come on, we, we got a gig in Mumbai. Not, not, see, he has his own, you know, uh, people to of course, find you, of course. talented yes. and all, yeah. I know. I, I was. It's more romantic if I think that he's checking it out at two in the morning and finds you himself. But, yes, I'm sure he has people who found you. But he's <laughs> very humble. He's very humble. Recently, he, sh he shared one of my uh, story on his page. Oh, Wow. Yeah, uh, he's amazing. I, I'm not a fan only of him. I'm I'm talking about Yoni also. Uh, you know, he's a major artist. Yoni. Yes. He replied. Yeah, he replied me, 
and he told me I visited your page and you are a talented musician and I really like your work and I was just got goosebumps oh my god wow are you going to play a gig with Yanni maybe <laughs> <laughs> You'll the sky's the limit. That's man. right. I, I like your it. attitude. I mean, you did do yeah. a song performing with, I was going to ask you about, with Dariu, Sheikh Bali. I mean, it seemed to be kind of a benefit or a charity project, but you're actually singing on it. Tell me how that came about. Yeah, one of my friends introduced me to that project. And when I was in Iran, you know, so I used to be a, a vocal, you know, vocal. I used to sing as a vocal, back vocal, I, I, actually. And yeah, he told me there is a project. And I said, yeah. I eagerly will do that, and we've done that, and I'm very happy. Well, it's uh, really impressive what you do. I love watching you play on your Instagram page, and I'm so thrilled that you came on our very program and and told told your story. I I, I really appreciate it. My, my final question that I had for you was: Do you think you'll stay in India? But I I think I have my answer. I mean, you're really enthusiastic about India, so I'm guessing this is home for you now. Of course, it's my home. It's my husband's home also. <laughs> I'm I am living here. But I don't know. Only God and maybe one day I will immigrate from here also. Well, maybe you and your husband will go to the America like your sister. Yeah, maybe. What is your, do you, if I were to say, uh, you're in your ultimate dream of where you take this, your pioneering role of playing the daff with Indian rhythms and the, the sky's the limit in terms of the world. Where would you mm -hmm. like to see yourself 10 or 20 years from now? Not only with my daff, I would love to be a singer, Jian. And I want to have my own institute, Iranian institute, and I want to teach my uh, traditional instrument daff and my culture to non-Iranian. I feel good about that, and I would love to go all around the world with my instrument. And first country which I just love to go is Switzerland. Switzerland? Yeah. Wow. I thought you were going to say Canada. Maybe after Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well I, to be honest, that doesn't seem like a, a big stretch for you to be traveling around the world performing. I'm sure you could book a tour tomorrow. I mean, you're you're so good, and um, and the sky is the limit. You're young and you, and you're great at what you do, and you're getting the kind yeah. of recognition you should be getting. Um, I'm so happy that we got to do this. Thank you for being on this program, and I I hope I get to see you before too long in India, in Canada, and Switzerland, wherever we can. Yeah, I'm very happy, and it was a great full uh, talking with you. And, you know, I want to just tell you one thing. If you believe in yourself, if you don't compare yourself with others, because I believe in your unique as your fingerprint, and you can manifest whatever you want. I've been manifesting whatever I wanted till now. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for that. Thank you, John, for having me. You gave me opportunity to talk. Talk soon. Merci. Khodafes. Orban Khodafes. Hamta Bahinejad. She's an Iranian Indian percussionist. She's actually the first Iranian woman to play Indian rhythms on the DAF. She joined us from Pune, India today. was fun how was that shaya yeah. some fun daft playing on the spot there um we are going to go from uh, let's see we're going to go from india to spain okay. right yes. now i'm going to reconvene the team uh after this uh next interview to talk about hamta and our next guest uh but let's go to our next percussionist because she's waiting on the line my next guest is one of the top references for flamenco and Latin percussion in Spain, a highly experienced professional percussionist specializing in cajon and congas. Take a listen to this.
yes, yes. A little taste of Nasreen Rahmani live on stage a couple of years ago, teasing different drum solo sounds out of a Latin percussion instrument called the cajon. She is a young master. So Nasreen was born in Australia to a Mauritian mother and Iranian father. She has been following her path as a percussionist ever since she laid eyes on a set of congas at the Woodford Folk Festival in Queensland, Australia. And upon completing a Bachelor of Music performance at the prestigious Victorian College of the Arts in Melbourne, she began making numerous study trips to Cuba to continue to fine-tune her skills on congas and timbales. She worked for many years in Melbourne as a percussionist in Latin jazz, pop, and world music projects. After meeting a local flamenco musician, she began to investigate that genre. And taking a serious interest in Cajon, she began traveling to Spain, eventually choosing to relocate to Madrid. Nasreen has accompanied a number of renowned artists in the Latin music genre and is the main percussionist for Diego Guerrero and Antonia Jimenez. She regularly gives master classes at percussion festivals in between constant local and international touring with artists of different genres and is also one of the main endorsers for La Rosa Percussion, one of the world's top manufacturers of flamenco cajones. Not bad for an Iranian kid from Australia right now. Nasreen Rahmani joins me from Madrid, Spain today. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. What a pleasure it is to have you here. You're such a great player. It's so much fun to to listen to you play. You understand that for the uninitiated, a woman with Iranian and Mauritius background who has an Australian accent and has become masterful at Latin percussion in Spain is is an interesting story, right? <laughs> it is. It is. It's um. It's a long story, and the question of where are you from? It's such a d- difficult question to answer right. for me right now. <laughs> how, how how do you currently answer that question? Um, it's a long story. <laughs> I was born in Australia and that, and that doesn't usually satisfy people, right, right. <laughs> especially if I'm not speaking English with my Australian accent, then people go, oh, okay, yeah. But if I'm speaking Sp- Spanish, it, it doesn't really match my image or the language I'm speaking. So they just, they don't, they're not, they're not comfortable with that. <laughs> I'm not good enough at Spanish to know. Do you speak Spanish with an Australian accent? No, I don't. Ah. Um, Yeah. So you have exotic looks, you speak Spanish, so nobody is necessarily at the top of the mind thinking Australian. Definitely not. Um, They might know that I am a foreigner um, just by a little hint in my accent, but it's impossible to tell where from. So, yeah. Did your Iranian dad have any thoughts on his daughter growing up to be a drummer? Um, Way, way, way back when I first started playing music he really wanted to encourage me to sing um just because i think he just had that image of women in music as being singers but i wasn't very good at singing so (laughs) once i started performing and and you know um taking up a career in music he he was encouraging of that i'm sure he's very they're very proud proud of you now i'm gonna get into your story but just before we start uh nasreen how has the gigging situation been in in spain as covid begins to ebb around the world and in europe are you are you back to playing gigs does it feel like normal times again or where are you at now we're definitely reactivating a lot here in spain we are starting to perform more and you know artists are are rehearsing shows and, and recording with you know more confidence in being able to actually execute their plans so does it affect what you play yeah. when you're touring locally rather than internationally do you have a, an international kind of set and then what you do locally is is a different kind of is more integrated into the sounds that people are more familiar with or something not really um the projects that i'm involved in pretty much play the same show whether it's sort of here or overseas um there's certainly in terms of traditional flamenco there's certainly more of an international market for traditional flamenco at a high level than there is in spain um oh really yeah i mean everybody knows flamenco in spain but it's still a it's a minority culture it's a minority um genre that people are interested in and um, if it weren't for public funding, it, it wouldn't really happen, um, regardless of the fact that it's such a, a huge draw card for tourists. And, right. <laughs> you know, it's such a huge... It's so um, associated with, you know, It's so Spain, Spain yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, behind all this sort of the flamenco industry and the tourism, there's, there's a culture and a lot of the, the people who 
who live the flamenco culture in their day-to-day -day lives, who wake up in the morning and they're singing flamenco and they're, they're, they're listening and, and practicing flamenco in, in their weddings and, and, and baptisms and family parties, that, that part of the culture is, is, is very minority and is not, is not really appreciated or represented by the, the majority and the re representative. You know, I want to get into the, the cajon and, and how some of it intersects with Middle Eastern music. But, you know, flamenco is big amongst Iranians. Did you know that? Or I guess you would know that. Um, I have discovered that recently thanks to Instagram. Yeah. You know, as I sort of follow like hashtag flamenco, flamenco guitar, cajon and that sort of thing, I, I can see that like half of the content is coming from Iran, like yeah. after Spain. <laughs> I'm like, what, what is this deep appreciation for flamenco in Iran? I'm yeah, just... you didn't think you were going back to your roots when you started playing flamenco, but somehow... No, no way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I want to ask you, I mean, I'll get into your story because you are, uh, you really are um, like, I guess, many of us these days, but you're such, so quintessentially so, this, a global citizen. I mean, as you say yourself, I mean, where do you even exist from? And uh, you grew up, though, in a pretty, as I understand it, a pretty uniform place. Everything I've heard about Queensland, Australia, I mean, it's, it's not the most diverse place in the world. Did you stand out as a kid? Um, at that time, you know, when I was young, it was not a very diverse place to grow up. I guess I didn't feel like I stood out as a kid because I, I was born in Australia and I moved to Queensland when I was three years old. So all of my earliest memories are, are from there. So without sort of realizing I was just another one of the other kids, but then, you know, just all the passing comments of oh, you have such lovely olive skin or or are you Aboriginal or, you know, just people seeing somebody who's different, they're instantly trying to go, okay, where do you fit in? So I, I, I do now, like reflecting back on that, I do know that people saw me as different, but I didn't really feel different. You didn't feel different. I mean, how did you self-identify as a kid? Were you aware of, I mean, what was the culture of the family like when you have a, a mom from Mauritius and a dad from uh, an Iranian background? Do you speak English in the house? Did he try to teach you Farsi? Was there, uh, what, was it, what was it like in the home? Um, I think my dad was very isolated in Australia. He, he didn't have community, like Iranian community to share with. And even though my mother speaks wonderful Farsi, they didn't speak um, Farsi at home to each other, mainly because my dad was, you know, making a huge effort to learn English. So by the time I was born, he was two years into sort of living in Australia and or more, maybe four years into living in Australia and was, you know, speaking enough English and, and, and they were just speaking English at home. Um, so I, I very, very rarely heard, heard them speak Farsi, just, you know, a few words here and there. Um, and my mum the same, she was living in Queensland, we were a long way from her family, so only sort of once or twice a year when we'd get together with my Mauritian cousins would I hear my auntie speaking Creole. So, you know, my upbringing was very, very Australian, very Anglo, you know, the music we listened to was just what was on the radio there. And Did they, what's their story? Did they meet in Queensland? No, um, my mum and dad, they met in Iran. My mum was living in Iran and teaching at a, a college for speech therapists. I think that she had she had set up with some, some colleagues of hers um, wow. in Tehran. So they met they met in Iran. My dad was um, doing his military service and he when he finished and the revolution was sort of beginning, they, they left. But my, my mum, she lived in Iran for seven years. So she really, you know, appreciates the culture and, and assimilated there and speaks wonderful Farsi and you know, but not you. Like you don't speak for No, I missed out on all of that. You know, <laughs> I guess they were making such a, like a not a, um, a like a conscious effort or or a, a tense sort of like oh we need to fit in here, but just a natural sort of way that they thought that we would for us for our future just just naturally fit in in Australia. Yeah. Well, they just sort of like okay, we're here, we're happy to be in Australia, we're happy to be here, and. We're just going to, you know, live this culture. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my parents were like that in Canada. It's like they're, they're protecting you. They're hoping that it, assimilation will be will make it better for you. And little did they know that, uh, you know, 20, 30 years later, we'd be like, but I want my Farsi to be better, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I understand uh, before you became this stellar musician, you, you took ballet as a kid, which you've described as terrible. <laughs> were you not cut out to be a ballerina? I think I found myself, I stumbled into ballet sort of as, as just tagging along with my sister. My sister loves dancing. You know, my, my mum says my sister was dancing before she could walk. 
but I, I I was always sort of in the ballet class. I never knew what was going on. I never learned the steps. I wasn't very flexible. Right. <laughs> so you originally start playing the guitar, and the story goes. I mean, correct me if this is wrong. That you you move to Melbourne, and it's when you get to Melbourne that you become enamored of Latin percussion, not just drums, but Latin percussion. What was it that grabbed you so much about that style of drums and percussion? Um, well, my first instrument was actually flute, similarly to ballet, like, uh, you know, I, I, I was at school, I wanted to learn an instrument, they came around with all the instruments, there was a trumpet there, I really wanted to play the trumpet, went home, mom, can I play the trumpet? No, your sister has a flute, you can use that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> played the flute for about five years, not, you know, my friends playing guitar, you know, songs I know on guitar, I was like, oh, this is a cool instrument, I want to play a cool instrument. Um, and then we started going to music festivals and I saw a band at a music festival playing with it with a conga player and I was like what are these these drums these conga drums they sound amazing I want I want to do this I want to do the conga drumming thing I was probably 13 um, but they didn't have any in the town where I lived and nobody knew what they were um, so when we moved to Melbourne because we moved because my sister was you know going to uni and it's this very diverse city with um, everything you can imagine and you know we walked past this shop with congas in it and I was like I need to work at this shop I need to I need to learn how to play this instrument and and so I went in there and I was like, I need a job, I need a job. And they gave me a job when I was fifteen. On oh Saturdays. wow, that's cool. Yeah. And they had they had they were selling congas, they were teaching conga lessons and djembe lessons and Brazilian percussion lessons and so I did all the lessons and I started then eventually teaching the courses that I'd done the lessons of and, and playing in a band with, with the the owner of the shop and people who were you go to the shop a lot. And at my high school, at the same time, I was like, I need a job, I need a job at this shop. I was like, I said to the high school, I need to play congas. I need to play, I want to play congas. This is my instrument. And they bought some congas for me. Like, and I, I was like flipping out because of course I didn't have any congas. And I, you know, I was like, can I learn this instrument? And there's this, this school in a, in a kind of a bit of a disadvantaged neighborhood where all these, you know, like a lot of kids at risk because they've been kicked out from other schools, just where we happened to be living at the time. And the government was just throwing money at this school. So they had amazing resources. And I had a recording studio, an amazing film studio, and, and, and I learned so much at this high school. Um, and, and, I, and I played my first congas there. So, You know, I always found it, uh, it never stopped being intimidating for me as a young drummer going into music shops or drum shops um, where I would always assume the person behind the desk is probably a better drummer than me, you know, because they sit there all day and they play and they're, you know, they've got all the riffs that, that, and, and so I, I never, I mean, even, even if I hadn't seen them play, like if I walked into your, your shop in, in Melbourne at the time, I'd probably think, oh, she's probably better than me at Congress. <laughs> so you kind of like, when you're trying out the drums, you kind of don't want to play too much because you don't want to tip the hand at how good you are or, or how good you're not. <laughs> Um, so you were that person in the shop, I guess. Oh, but like you were not the people coming in. Like the people coming in <laughs> were coming in and they wanted to play everything at the same time. And I was there just like listening to like wild hippie drumming all day. <laughs> oh, and right. then people trying out violins and double basses all at the same time. It was just noise. Right, and I right. developed an incredible ability to just, you know, tune out on tune in <laughs> and have patience and, you know. Nothing like arrhythmic hippie drumming to to. to oh to yeah, get you it was in. like yeah, people would, and the, the same guys would come in every day and play all the drums. But you know, eventually they'd buy one. Yeah, I guess that's why I was there as well, just to kind of be nice to them while the boss was like doing something important. It's, it's so it's so interesting to me that you took these trips to Cuba. I want to ask you what you learned. I guess you were sort of. Were you at university at the time or around that time you were going back and forth to Cuba? I mean, living in Canada or North America, Canadians, uh, you know, Americans haven't been able to go there for many years because of the situation. But uh, for Canadians, it's an easy destination. To go all the way from Australia to Cuba is quite a trek. Um, I, I wonder what you learned from watching Cuban musicians, how it inspired you. Well, um, after many years listening to Afro-Cuban rumba to like salsa, New York salsa as well, being interested in knowing, you know, different percussionists who had been to Cuba, I was like, I have to go to Cuba to get good at the congas. And, you know, all the percussionists, you know, in Australia were like making these pilgrimages, you know, to get lessons there for a few months and come back and everyone would come back like inspired and playing heaps better. So I was like, Look, this is what I have to do. And I really wanted to do that like as, as, I, as soon as I got out of high school, but I was too young to kind of go anywhere. And I was like, okay, let's do the university thing just until I... And I think I was like just 21 
and I, you know, saved up a bit of money and I went on like this crazy round the world trip um, hmm. to Cuba and then the rest of, and then all over the place and didn't speak any Spanish, didn't really know anybody there. You know, I had a few addresses and phone numbers and I was like really young and had no idea. And I think I learned so much, like I learned how to speak Spanish the hard way, like just literally as a matter of life and death, I have to learn Spanish right now. I learned a lot about, you know, how to take care of myself and how to be safe. And, you know, obviously I was, you know, on my own, didn't know what was going on. So I was just like taking it real slow. And I, and I learned a lot of percussion, obviously, but also I learned how to manage myself in every situation you can imagine. So it was, it was a wonderful trip. I was there for three months. Um, oh, wow. You were in Cuba for three months? Yeah, uh -oh, I was there for okay. three months. For so, the f the first trip, I've been four times now. So. so that really would have been an education for you. Were you like you found a music community there and started jamming with them or, or, or learning from them? I had a lot of lessons. Um, I had two different teachers, and yeah, so I was living there and just going to gigs and going to see lots of just you know just absorbing everything, um, really taking it in. And the lessons, you know, some of the lessons were really good and some of the lessons were not so good. I was, it was a bit of a hit and miss. You know, my teacher, you know, some days he'd be up and, and lucid and other days he wouldn't be. <laughs> but that was a learning experience too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was an amazing time. And Cuba was a different place than it is now. Like, you know, that was 2004, 2005. And, you know, as I've been back, I've seen Cuba change. I was there in 2019 as well. Huge differences totally different place um, for better and for worse so but yeah um, about 18 months later when, when I got back to Australia um, the band that I was playing in had got a conga player to replace me and instead of sort of him leaving the band he stayed and I started playing timbales I was like okay now I have to go back and learn timbales <laughs> so I went back to take timbale lessons which is, it occurs to me, is quite different because timbales, I mean, congas and, and cajon, for that matter, you play, you play with your, uh, your hands. Timbales, you're using sticks, right? Is that, is that a big step for somebody who's uh, trained in conga? Yeah, it's a big step because my, my, my stick technique wasn't amazing. And also, the timbales are the other way around. So, right. Yeah, and it's, you know, more coordination, like... To paint different patterns at once, whereas congas are sort of one pattern between two hands. For the timbales, it's like two or three patterns at once. But it was always the Latin stuff that you were drawn to. Like you didn't want to, you didn't want to play Led Zeppelin. You don't want to be John Bonham. You don't want to be like the Led Zeppelin uh, person behind the kit, or to play like um, super freeform jazz or something like. That. It was always this Latin thing was really in you from that early age, huh? Yeah, the drum set was never something I could kind of dominate. At like whenever I sat at the drums, it's like oh, I did. I did practice, you know, go through a few stages in my life where I had drums at home. I'd sort of have a bit of muck around, but it's always just this enormous beast that I could never kind of get under control. I found the cymbals really loud, and the drums like all oh, just could never get the volume of everything right. Just never sounded right. Yeah. Would, however long would sit there, it's like this doesn't sound good. Yeah. So I mean, and the connection of the like the hand percussion is just so, this organic connection that I just. I just felt really naturally immediately. So um, obviously in Australia, like I didn't have a lot of choice of what kind of music I could play. You know, for, for hand percussion, you could go the African way or Brazilian or the or the, the Afro-Cuban or the, the Cuban salsa way. And there's a, like a bit more of a bigger salsa scene than there was the African and Cuban, even though I did sort of do that, the others a little bit. Just by the time I left to go to Spain, I had been playing so many different kinds of music and obviously having studied jazz at uni, and all my uh, having a lot of friends in the jazz scene, and then you know they were calling me to do gigs as well, like a bit more Latin jazz vibe and that sort of thing. So. And and yet your story really seems to underscore this idea that to be one of the best, you have to go to the pond where the best are playing. I mean, both in terms of your trip to Cuba and what you were experiencing there, and then what you've said about moving to Madrid, how it changed everything in, for you in terms of taking you to the next level as a drummer. Uh, can you describe that? Um, well, yeah, sure. Like as, as a percussionist in Australia, as you can imagine, well, now it's growing, but at the time when I was in Melbourne, you know, there was probably four or five percussionists, but moving here has been a huge, a huge challenge and, um, achievement for me to be able to, you know, work here, um, amongst such a high level of playing because here there is like 
thousands and thousands of percussionists, mm. not five. <laughs> and they are amazing. They're just yes. children being born with yeah. like five, ten years old, just playing the cajon. Amazing, amazing. So, yeah. Let me ask you about the cajon. Uh, it's it's it is a wonder to me as a drummer, like what you can. I mean, you can make the thing talk. It's it's amazing watching you play. It's like you can find a whole drum kit in in a cajon. I mean, I've seen people talk about this before. That you know, there's the top is the snare drum and the the toms are there. You can find a hi hat. You got the the kick drum somewhere in the low middle of it. Um, it is just this little rectangular box. What what is the key to being a great cajon player? Good question. Key to being a great cajon player is having really good rhythm and <laughs> having, a, a, I think, a, a, a real dominance of the language and, and the instrument. I mean, it's like any other instrument. It is a very simple instrument and, and you have to get the right sounds out of it. Like you have to put a lot of time into getting good sound out of the instrument. It's really, the, the cajon, especially outside of Spain, is, it, is an instrument that gets very quickly written off as a bit of a joke. And I find that sad because i think because a lot of amateurs take up the cajon uh, for the reason that it's e like you can immediately get a sound out of it like right. just immediately you play it and a sound comes out because it looks so simple it's a a box and you're hitting it with your hands right it and is it, it is easy to get a good sound of the, out of the cajon where whereas with with the congas for example it is very difficult to get a yes. good sound out of the congas yes. so in that's that's why it's been such a, a an easily accessible instrument and also because they're not too expensive um, so, you know, the cajon is the new djembe and there, there's one on every corner, but I mean, that doesn't mean that like the djembe is not, um, can be not be played at an amazing level. Same as the guitar, you get the amateur guitarist sure. on the, sure. on the corner, but you know, you don't send Instagram DM messages to professional guitarists going, oh, what a shame that you play the guitar. Like I, I've <laughs> occasionally got messages like that. Oh, you, you regret really? the what a shame you play the cajon. Like, there's anti-cajon discrimination, huh? Yeah, yeah, especially around, I think, mostly coming from Germany. Like, I've seen videos of people, like, spurning cajons and smashing them and stuff. It's like, yeah, I think they just get tired of, like, I get maybe buskers or people sort right. of just playing covers right. on the cajon. Which but it's I, very I, it's very nuanced. I mean, obviously you have to have rhythm and be fast and or you know and have strong or know what you're doing. But it's it's super nuanced in terms of exactly how your fingers are hitting this box, exactly where you're hitting it, which part of yeah. your hand you're using, all of that, right? Yeah, you got to know how, you got to know where to play it, the technique. Um, there are many different types of technique for the cajon. Depends on the kind of cajon. Um, and what kind of music you're trying to play. But yeah, there's there's a lot of nuances, many, many, many sounds, especially in flamenco, like a good flamenco cajon player can get 10 or 15 different sounds out of the cajon. Is it ever limiting not having a, a physical kit in front of you, not having toms? And I mean, I've seen you play sometimes you do have cymbals or you have like a cymbals and a snare and, and your cajon. But um, but do, do you ever feel it's limiting or is it, on the other hand, emancipating? I mean, you can't pull out a drum kit and play at a party, but I guess you can bring your cajon, right? No, I don't feel limited by the cajon because the, the people, my references for cajon are people who can make a stadium full of people dance with a cajon or or be entertained for an hour with just a cajon with no cymbal, no hi-hat, no cowbell. I mean, the only limit is my technique or my musical limitations. Right. Um, then it depends on the kind of music you're playing. So sometimes for certain kinds of music, I want some cymbals to fill it out because it's slow. It's like a slow song and I want the cymbals to fill out the space a little bit while I kind of keep the rhythm going. So... It really depends on what you're playing. Well, after I was I was considering the con and I, and I was thinking, I mean, watching you play and preparing for this interview, and I was thinking, it almost makes it feel like the drum kit is cheating because <laughs> because you you do have to get all of those sounds out of this one little box, whereas um, you, you know anyone can uh, sit in front of a kit and hit the different parts of it and get different sounds, right? I mean, not to say that it's easy to play the a, a drum kit in a in a really profound or professional way, but there's there's a real beauty to the simplicity of your of your instrument and how you're bringing this stuff out. It reminds me of when um, physical trainers say, you know, you don't actually need to go to a fancy gym with all that equipment. You can do this outside, you know, on a hill, yeah. run back, and, and and but uh, we somehow feel like we need all of this stuff, right? Um, mm. And that it's all about the simplicity of what you can do with this instrument. Are you 
Are you aware that I've seen um, Iranian percussionists playing the cajon, making like Iranian classical or Iranian jazz rock kind of music? Are you are you aware that it seems to cross musical boundaries in that way? Yes, definitely. Um, I see the cajon being used in all kinds of music, every kind of music you can think of. But especially in Iran, I have seen it being used in, in Iranian music. I follow quite a few Iranian percussionists. Yeah, I can see that they, they love the cajon and they're using it in the traditional rhythms. And yeah, there's no limit to, to what you can use it for. There are obviously like anything and anything else, there are stereotypes when it comes to Latin music. And even though it's still surprising, you've said there are st- there were at least stereotypes around a woman playing cajon. Uh, can you reflect on that? Um, I think... Just as there, that women are not represented in in many professions across the board, that they're not highly represented in music and especially in percussion and especially in flamenco and especially in flamenco percussion. <laughs> so we're talking about a, a musical genre where there are almost no female instrumentalists right. being flamenco. And then I'm here, and I'm I'm sort of integrating into the into the scene, into the culture, and I have no almost no references of women sort of working professionally in flamenco. Um, there's only one one woman who played cajon, and she still plays, but she has not been accepted in the way that she should have been. So that for me was like, oh, okay. So am I going to be an outcast here as well, <laughs> or what? What? Is, how is this going to work? You know. But I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, people have no choice then to see you know what you bring to the table musically my number one challenge has been to grow musically not has not been to change the culture or or, you know represent women in in flamenco that's that's not my fight my fight is to just be a better percussionist than i was yes but needless to say you didn't have a lot of female role models on cajon coming up right no no i didn't have any until you know I, i i came here and i saw her play but but once, once again, it's, it's, they're, re- they're still very much on the periphery. I was going to ask you about that. You know, we just talked to Hamta Bali. Um, she's another woman of Iranian background who's, I think, a masterful percussionist. In this case, she's in India and playing uh, different kinds of drums. But do, do you see in general, I mean, globally, big changes in the profile of who's playing drums these days? Yes, especially in drum set, in well, in all areas, um, Latin percussion as well. There's so many amazing female percussionists now. Huge tendency to like of growth of female percussionists. There's just more and more and more and more. And I think it's so wonderful because it's just answered all these doubts and questions of you know when I was younger. It's like because people were like, no, you need to be strong to play the congas. You need to be physically strong. You need to be able to hit hard you need to be able to carry your drums and it's like you know uh, okay but then there's like patato who's this tiny little cuban guy he's like amazing player but he's he's tiny probably way less than me you know right didn't somebody also tell you that it's ugly for women to play the car yeah yeah i did get yeah i got that yeah but that same person is now one of my number ones like what a very good friend of mine and supports me and that was just a comment that I was like, oh, okay, so this is what the culture is thinking. But I think that's changed a lot. And I get mostly, I mostly support and praise because, you know, I've been here working professionally for over 10 years now. And a lot of people know me and a lot of people support me. So I don't think that those kind of comments can really be, be um, go by so easily. <laughs> They're not going to bring you down at this point. I know you're working with uh, Diego Guerrero. I can only imagine you have uh, touring plans and recording plans. Where do you, I, ideally, I mean, and you do these master classes, um, but where do you see yourself taking this? I mean, what what do you aspire to, given that you're a bit of a pioneer uh, on the cajon as, as um, um, a woman who's gotten to the place you've gotten to, where, do you, where would you like to be with this in 20 years from now? My, my only ambition is to become better at recording, better at playing my instruments and play with better artists, play with the artists that I admire and that I would just really love to play with. But um, it's, it's happening very slowly, <laughs> very, very slowly and with very, very much hard work and frustration and dedication. Um, I'm going in the right direction, so I can't really ask for much more. 
something I really appreciate you about you, Nestrine, is you have a very positive outlook. Uh, you've said you wake up happy, happy each day, grateful for what you have. Uh, how did you achieve that kind of positivity? If I could ask you a non-drum related question before we end. Oh, that's very easy to answer. How did I achieve that? Um, by doing what I love. Hmm. That's it. So I didn't choose to do what would be safe or um, secure or make money or um, guaranteed. I just did what I love and follow like like what I love and not what you know I thought would be sensible or <laughs> I love that. or secure. <laughs> I love that because you know I, I have no regrets. I yeah. love that you know what you love and that you're good at it and that you're that you made it happen and you went there. I mean it, it's 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 beautiful. Now will you ever return to your um your career as a ballerina? Will that uh, is that, uh, will you return <laughs> oh, to the ballet? <laughs> um oh I don't think so. I'm really not I was never good at that. Um so <laughs> It's really great to have you on the show. I do hope your Iranian dad is is as proud of you as he should be and I uh, I love watching your your videos and, and listening to your your music, but I hope I get to see you perform live. I hope you guys tour in North America before too long, or we find you in Europe. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful to chat to you. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Nasreen Rahmani, an Iranian Australian Spanish professional percussionist specializing in cajon and congas. Nasreen Rahmani joined us from. Madrid, Spain today. All right, let's turn the microphones back on uh, over there. Captain Reza, Gugi Shaya, Fabulous Keon. I always envy a percussion player because of uh, their speed. They are very fast, and I think I, I, I'm generally slow. You know, I, yeah. I slow player, I'm slow mm-hmm. speaker, and so I always envy them. The Mm-hmm. with their fingers with their hands and it's mm-hmm. amazing i always envy them it although is? i thought what uh Nasreen was saying was interesting that it's not always about it's speed exact, you know yeah. learning how to really it's uh, about feeling yeah. it's an instrument mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's right yeah it is exciting to be honest now that i i feel like cajon might be easy to play <laughs> i want to go mm-hmm. buy it i'm gonna go buy one and practice it no it's not it's what she was saying it looks it seems easy it seems both of these instruments yes the daf and the cajon yeah. they just seem like anybody can play them but the the delta between somebody who can actually play yeah. and somebody who's like it, it is it's like a piano i mean mm. you, you know you can hit the keys and make a noise but does that mean you can play the piano yeah I bet you this is the most ancient form of music too, because I mean, like yeah, you know, you're right. thinking of like, like back when Neanderthals were roaming the earth. Like dum, dum, the first dum. thing they do is bang around, and you know. Mm. Thank you, Keon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated. That it's <laughs> Everything was going well with the show until we turned the microphones back on with you guys. <laughs> I was like having great conversations <laughs> with drummers, you know. <laughs> yeah, you were super into it. <laughs> yeah, that I was, was into it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Until we ruined Sorry, it. Sorry, we're you. not experts. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to say that, you know, one of the recent cajon was, uh, became popular in mm-hmm. Iran. You know, Thank uh, you for saying it the Spanish way. Uh, mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> cajon. 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 Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you know, because it's kind of, as you said, it's like a drum in a box. Yes. So... Uh, the shape of drum on a stage it kind of it shows a like a rock band and uh-huh. so musician they they were trying to ditch the get around the rules yes ah. yes and so they and so the box is less is, is more yeah, innocuous it's a box. Right. yeah but it could ha- it have a kick it have a snare and so mm. it became more popular and popular and it yeah mm. You know, I think the Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first instrument that they they played. Uh, is that not interesting kids. to when anybody? When they were playing flamenco music. <laughs> you know, it wasn't the guitar, it was the, it was the drums. <laughs> I was going to ask you, Gian, how did you pick the drums over every other instrument? What uh, was it? I don't know. I was really, I, actually, I think the first instrument, there's a picture of me. I was on a BBC show when I was four or Whoa. five playing the drum kit. Are you, you playing, serious? Yeah, 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 playing... Yeah, it was a, it was a program called Watch, Watch, <laughs> uh, you know, Watch, and and uh, yeah, there's a, I, I was playing 
kit and then bongos and stuff. Uh, I was just always into it. And then by grade seven, I had a, I was terrorizing my parents because we got a drum kit in the house. <laughs> like, how did uh, you end up on the BBC at four years old? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I don't remember how that happened. <laughs> wow. You know, I think it was my school uh, was invited and I was one of the music, uh, you know, I played the drums or something. Oh. I, I can't remember how it happened. You're a prodigy, weren't you? Do you still yeah. have that picture? Yeah. That's yeah, so yeah, cute. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a nice memory. Um, well, thank you uh, for these uh insightful comments uh keon and <laughs> and Reza and shaya i listen monday behzad bulur uh for a feature interview on rook i'm really looking forward to that also in the coming days Kayvon zand uh dr sheila nazarian tara tiba and more a big thank you to sasha shabani once again for and bongoplanet.com bongoplanet.com for helping us out with this episode of Rook, Sasha Shabani and bongoplanet.com. And uh, again, if you like what you hear, rookmedia.com, we'd love you to become a patron. Uh, just press the support us button really for $5 or $10 a month. It makes a big difference to us. Thank you guys. See you Monday. This is full time for Rook for today. And for all things Rook, go to our website, rookmedia.com. Thank you to the amazing team who put this show together. Producer Susan, Ponce the Artist, Thoughtful Nagin, The Fabulous Keon, Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, Groovy Shaya, and Aray Merdad. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe. And if you haven't done so already on any of our platforms, they're free. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Find us at Rook Media everywhere, including Clubhouse, which we'll return to at some point. Oh, really? Sure, why not? Okay. In the meantime, Mizunbashi. Bye.